So uh, should I, I'll just make a, a quick opening remark here. Uh, so usually it would be Vicki Essies, who's the director of NEST, who would be uh, saying hello to you all. She's not well today, so I agreed to step in. I'm Mark Jonas. I'm the Associate Dean of Research for the Faculty of Social Science. So I'm just here to say hello to everybody and thank you all for coming. Some, some of you I see regularly, some of you I see very rarely. So it's, uh, it's nice to see everybody and to see such a big uh, turnout. Um, I'm going to let Martin do the proper introducing of Catherine, but before I do that, I'll just mention that we're being recorded today. So if you want to be camera off in order to not appear on YouTube and so on, feel free to do so. Uh, so just a heads up on that. So let me pass it over to Martin to uh, introduce Katie. Okay, thanks, Mark. And uh, thanks, everybody, for coming out. Uh, virtually, that is. It's great to see the turnout. Um, so. My name is Martin Horak. For those of you who don't know me, I'm a, a professor of political science here at Western and also associate director of the Center for Urban Policy and Local Governance, which is co-sponsoring our talk. Um, so just before I introduce our speaker, um, I'd like to acknowledge that Western University is located on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabek, the Haudenosaunee, the Lenapewak, and the Attawandron peoples. Um, and let us be mindful of the covenants that have been made and broken with the indigenous peoples who continue to make these lands their home. Um, and in fact, of course, indigenous peoples in Canada are among the mo most likely to live in inadequate housing and to experience housing affordability issues. And we all know by now that housing affordability is an important and a growing policy concern, some would say a crisis in Canada today as it is in the United States. And we also know from research in both countries that homeowners are really engaged in local politics and that they care a lot about protecting their property values. Um, and our distinguished speaker's work connects these phenomena, uh, focusing on how homeowner engagement in local politics shapes housing policies. Um, so I'm very pleased to have with us Catherine Levine Einstein. Uh, she's an associate professor of political science at Boston University and a faculty fellow at the Initiative on Cities. Um, her re research and teaching focuses on urban politics, urban policy, racial and ethnic politics, and public policy more generally. Um, she's one of the authors of Neighborhood Defenders, Participatory Politics and America's Housing Crisis, which is one of the pieces that she's gonna be talking about today. Um, and her articles have also appeared in a variety of um, top-notch peer-reviewed journals, including American Journal of Political Science, Perspectives on Politics, Political Behavior, and Urban Affairs Review. Um, she's one of the principal investigators of the Menino Survey of Mayors, about which we were talking this morning in our workshop. Um, and uh, her research has been supported by grants from the National Science Foundation, the Russell Sage Foundation, and the Rockefeller Foundation. So we're so pleased to have you with us today, Professor Einstein. Thank you. And I'll turn things over to you now. I think you're going to talk for somewhere in the neighborhood of 40, 45 minutes. And so then we'll have plenty of opportunity for discussion. Wonderful. Um, thank you so much for this kind introduction. Um, thank you to, to Western and Nest for having me here um, and to Martin for, for helping to organize this and make it all so seamless as we dealt with um, the ever-changing uh, COVID situation and how this shaped um, the visit. I wish very much I could have been there in person um, and to meet you all in person, um, but I'm really grateful that you're, despite Zoom fatigue, coming today um, to hear this talk. Um, so what I'm gonna to talk to you guys about today is some of the uh, my published and ongoing research on housing policy. And I wanna acknowledge my amazing co-authors at Boston University, David Glick, Max Palmer, and Luisa Godinez Puig. Um, this work was co-authored with various of them. So I'm gonna share my screen. All right, great. Okay. Can everyone see slides okay? Awesome, yeah. So I want to start us with this abandoned warehouse in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, this warehouse is located um, right next to a major mass transit stop, the Porter Square T-Stop, um, you know, just outside of Boston. It's a very dense area. 
um, and an area where there is a crushing housing demand um, and escalating housing prices. So a developer purchased um, this abandoned warehouse back in 2015 and proposed converting this commercial space into a residential space um, because such a conversion requires um, a special permit under Cambridge land use regulations. The developer had to present his plans um, at a local planning board meeting. So he presented these plans, um, his goal of building four condominium units, each with one parking space to the planning board. Um, after presenting these plans, the planning board proceeded to ask um, pretty technocratic questions um, about the location of the units, the location of staircases and windows and that type of thing. After the planning board asked their questions, proceedings were then turned over to members of the public. Um, and that's where um, the, the conversation became considerably more negative. So folks um, from the community came and had various complaints. Um, some worried about the density of the housing development or felt that um, there wasn't sufficient parking. Um, another person actually came prepared with handouts um, that indicated that the um, proposed plans, according to this individual, violated existing um, zoning and land use regulations. So after hearing from members of the public, the planning board was considerably more negative about the proposal and said that the developer needed to go back and speak to the neighborhood and come back in three months with um, follow up plans. So the developer did so and they came back in three months and said, OK, instead of four condominium units, we're going to do three. And instead of one parking space per unit, we're going to do two parking spaces per unit. And at that point, the planning board approved the plan, which has now come to fruition. There are now three condominium units at this site. Um, and so one of the things that we were really interested in interrogating and in what ultimately became our book, Neighborhood Defenders, was whether this process in which the community engaged in this back and forth with the developer, whether that process was sort of a positive where neighborhoods were able to extract concessions for a developer, or whether it in fact empowered an unrepresentative group to stop and delay development and reduce the uh, supply of housing in their community. And at one level, you might say, who really cares if there's four units versus three? That doesn't sound like a huge difference. But one of the reasons that we thought that understanding these really hyper local processes was critical to understanding our broader housing crisis is this process isn't just a one off. It repeats hundreds and hundreds of times over in cities, not just across the United States, but in Canada, in the United Kingdom, in Australia, and places that have these kinds of zoning and planning processes. Um, and and so we were really interested in understanding sort of how this small hyperlocal process might have a market effect on the housing supply and consequently affordability of housing in communities where housing is desperately needed. So we study these community meetings um, and democratic representation in our book, Neighborhood Defenders. And what we really interrogate is how do local participatory processes affect what gets built and where it gets built? Um, and the punchline from our book, and I'll present some empirical evidence that hopefully convince you of this, is that what these meetings do in practice is empower an unrepresentative group of privileged white older homeowners to stop, stall, and shrink proposals and in turn contribute to an escalating housing crisis. So in American land use processes, and again, this is not just unique to the United States, though it is perhaps particularly acute here given our emphasis on local government. Um, neighbors and abutters are officially invited to participate in the housing development process. So when a developer proposes a plan that involves more than one unit of housing, more often than not, he or she has to present their plans in front of a planning or zoning board in order to receive sort of special permission or a variance from existing zoning. Those hearings are open to members of the public and people who live nearby are explicitly invited they receive notifications by law. This process also frequently explicitly empowers neighborhood associations and neighborhood councils as well as property owners to either bargain with the developers or those groups are explicitly invited to participate in these meetings. Um, and I flag, and this is from some work that um, my colleague Max Palmer and I published um, this year, that this um, sort of political institutional reification of homeownership has a long history in American politics. 
Um, so one of the things that we were really interested in studying was how American political institutions, just historically, have entrenched home ownership. And we specifically wanted to see um, how much property rights was um, emphasized as, as a requirement for local voting. Um, and one of the things that we found, which is really surprising, so most accounts of voting rights in the United States suggest that like property requirements go away in the 1850s, but it turns out they actually persisted for another century until they were ruled unconstitutional in most contexts um, in local elections. And here, just by way of one example of the way these persisted for over a century, um, are property requirements um, for local bond referenda. And you can see the number of states that still had those in place in 1968, which was the year um, that they were ruled unconstitutional for bond referenda. Um, so even you know, past uh, thinking beyond just voting institutions, more generally, homeowners in American politics are perceived as having more rights. Um, and this is just one example um, from a, a conservation commission meeting um, where a participant was complaining about this idea of renters having input, but they're not property owners. They're not as invested in the community, according to this individual. They're not going to be living in the neighborhood forever. Um, and I think anyone who's gone to enough public hearings has heard some version of this. That this implication that property owners should have more of a stake over local politics, right? So to study how much, how overrepresented homeowners are in these local political proceedings, uh, my co-authors and I turned to reading thousands of pages of meeting minutes to understand both the dynamics of these, um, these planning and zoning board meetings, um, but also to really document the demographics of the folks who are participating. So what we did is we downloaded every single planning and zoning board meeting, uh, meeting minute for over a three year period for 97 cities and towns in Massachusetts. And we collected data from all meetings that discuss the construction of more than one unit of housing. So this includes like infill developments if someone's building an accessory dwelling unit in their backyard. It also includes large apartment complexes. And I note that the dynamics that we find in our data persist across different types of housing development. They persist across big developments and small developments, and they persist across um, affordable housing developments and market rate housing developments. So the reason we focus on Massachusetts, we we're in Massachusetts, so you might think that it was just a proximity thing, um, but it was actually because open meeting laws in Massachusetts mandated that these meeting minutes featured an unusual level of detail about the participants in these hearings. So we were able to get the names and addresses of the folks who participated in these hearings, along with the positions that they took on um, housing development. So in about 50% of the cases, the meeting minutes also included the reasons people gave um, for their positions um, on a particular housing development. So we were able, um, I should say, to analyze 3,300 commenters who made 4,200 comments. Um, so a lot of folks in this data set. Um, and so we merged those names and addresses, again, with administrative data, both from the voter file and from property records, to be able to learn this valuable demographic information. And so the comparison that I'm presenting to you here is actually these commenters to voters who are themselves privileged in American politics, right? So this isn't comparing the demographics of commenters to the general public. It's comparing them to voters who are already more likely to be older, whiter, and homeowners. Um, and you can see that the people who comment at these hearings are somewhat more likely to be men, and they're somewhat more likely to be white, they're dramatically more likely to be over the age of 50, and they're dramatically more likely to be homeowners. So they're unrepresentative on dimensions that you perhaps might have expected if you study political inequality and political participation. Um, but we suggest that the magnitude of these findings is really striking, that you don't often find participatory disparities on this scale when you study political inequality. Again, perhaps not surprising anyone who's ever been to one of these hearings, um, there's an overwhelming bias towards opposition here, right? So we find um, that almost two thirds of the people who show up to these hearings show up in opposition to the construction of new housing. And only 14% 
of people who show up to these hearings show up in support of this housing. Um, and this is in stark contrast to sort of broader public opinion data about housing. Um, so in Massachusetts, there was actually a ballot referenda in 2010 about legislation related to the production of affordable housing. Um, and Massachusetts voters um, sort of supported that by an overwhelming majority. Yet when we compare at the town level, Per, you know, support for housing at public meetings to support for this affordable housing referendum. Um, the, the differences are just dramatic um, and there is considerably less support for specific housing developments than there is support for this broader affordable housing. So because um, we were analyzing um, this sort of amazing, um, really rich data, we were also able to learn a little bit more about why people express support or opposition for the construction of new housing. Um, and obviously here you can see they offer lots of different reasons for their support um, and opposition, but a few different trends that I'll note. Um, folks who oppose the construction of new housing are significantly more likely to mention things like traffic, safety, the environment, and density. In contrast, supporters of new housing are relatively more likely to flag things like affordability, right? So there are different concerns being raised by supporters and opponents of new housing. Um, and we found um, the references to environmentalism in particular among opponents to be striking um, because there's sort of widespread recognition that one of the best ways um, that we can reduce emissions, um, particularly in metropolitan areas like Boston, like many of the communities in California that are having a lot of these conversations, is by building more densely close to mass transportation. Um, and instead, we sort of see that opponents to housing are referencing environmental concerns um, when suggesting that we shouldn't be building new housing, even in those kinds of dense transit oriented communities. So what do folks say? How, how effective are they at these meetings? Um, you, one of the things that we were able to do is dig in more qualitatively to see the kinds of arguments um, that opponents to new housing used. And we identified across these comments a few different common trends. So the first is that opponents to new housing would regularly sort of wield expertise in some way, um, either real or imagined, um, to justify their perspectives, right? So a lot of the folks who show up to these hearings um, are in privileged professions. They're lawyers, um, they're architects, they're realtors, um, they're doctors. And so they will use that professional expertise to challenge whether a traffic study was indeed accurate or whether um, emergency vehicles can arrive quickly enough according to sort of existing traffic studies. Um, and that expertise is really persuasive um, to planning and zoning board officials. And it is also dissuasive to other potential participants in these public hearings who might feel intimidated by that kind of expertise. We also found that opponents to new housing in particular um, showed a lot of organization when they showed up to these hearings. So often a group of neighbors would show up together, many times through neighborhood associations and neighborhood councils. They would sometimes bring along a political representative, such as a city councilor who represented that district, um, to these meetings, again, to sort of bring more political heft um, to their oppositions. And finally, and this may actually be the most effective strategy um, that these neighborhood defenders were able to use, is the threat of lawsuits. So many people showed up to these hearings and either brought lawyers or were themselves lawyers or intimidated or intimated that they knew lawyers um, as a way of threatening developers. Um, and in interviews with developers, we found that a fear of lawsuits was really powerful. Lawsuits are incredibly expensive for development. They can delay projects by years um, and those carrying costs um, can make a project prohibitive. Um, we were able also, we um, as part of the book project, we collected data on actual lawsuits filed in Massachusetts land court about housing developments and were able to link many of those lawsuits with people who showed up to public hearings beforehand. So to think about these results sort of in a broader context, what we found was that advantaged people and advantaged communities were more likely to show up in opposition to the construction of all types of new housing. Um, and this was true for both large and small projects and for affordable and market rate projects. And so what this meant was that advantaged places were protected from development, leaving less advantaged places more vulnerable um, to development pressures. 
And this in turn leads potentially to gentrification in some places. If wealthy areas are better able to organize to oppose housing, Developers are strategic. We found in interviews, they know exactly where they're likely to encounter steep opposition and they avoid those communities because it makes development either impossible or very expensive. And so instead, gentrifying areas end up bearing the brunt of development pressures. And this in turn makes those communities understandably more likely to, or more unlikely, I should say, to endorse solutions oriented towards market rate housing and creates these real fissures in affordable housing coalitions. Um, and we've seen this play out at the state level in a number of states across the United States. Um, I also want to emphasize that the dynamics here, I'm, I'm primarily using data from a very high cost area, um, the greater Boston area. We also did qualitative interviews um, and sort of in-depth archival analysis in a number of different communities across the United States and found that some of these dynamics actually also manifest in lower cost communities as well, that even in sort of places that aren't experiencing the same pressures in their housing markets, we still see in high opportunity areas, privileged white homeowners mobilize to stop the construction of new housing. So obviously the housing context um, and sort of housing market um, shapes um, these dynamics to some extent, but there are um, important commonalities that exist across the country. So um, these are, it's pretty depressing um, findings thus far and sort of after doing all this research um, and presenting these results, um, particularly to policymakers, we would always get a, a question like, okay, what can we do about this? Um, and one form of um, question that we got a lot is like, oh, could our, could our community provide childcare or you know, provide free food to incentivize people to show up? Um, and I, I love childcare. You know, anyone who offers me free childcare is a friend and I love free food. Those are great things. Um, but the problem is they don't necessarily make people more interested in attending these hyper-local meetings, right? They may make it easier to participate but they aren't necessarily going to generate greater interest. Um, and so, you know, getting to the sort of modern era um, during the, the global pandemic, we've then gotten the question, does Zoom help? Would online meetings help? And our hypothesis going into this was that Zoom would actually suffer from a similar problem, that it would potentially make it easier for people to participate, but it wouldn't necessarily make proceedings more interesting or make it more likely that people would feel engaged in these proceedings. So we were somewhat skeptical going into this analysis that Zoom would dramatically reduce um, participatory disparities, um, but we wanted to dig into this more. We really want to find solutions to this challenge, right? So the first thing I'm going to talk about is to Zoom help. Um, we're also, I, we've also been doing some ongoing work looking at innovative community engagement strategies, and I'm going to highlight a few examples, one from Newton, Massachusetts, and the other actually from Canada and Toronto. All right, so I'm going to start with our research on Zoom meetings. Um, so this was data that we started collecting um, at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, when a lot of local governments across the country um, shifted their meetings to Zoom. Um, so we collected data between March and September 2020 um, from the same exact communities for which we collected data um, between 2015 and 2017, so we could have a good benchmark. And we got data on 798 commenters who made over a thousand comments. Um, we were able to get slightly fewer cities and towns just because of the availability of meeting minutes, um, so we did a direct comparison between those communities. Um, and what we found was um, remarkably similar participatory disparities. Um, so during, um, so once again, we found um, that women were underrepresented, right? Um, we found that white people were dramatically overrepresented. People over the age of 50, this was surprising to us, were really overrepresented and homeowners were once again overrepresented. Similarly, we found that the bias remained overwhelmingly towards those who were opposed to the construction of new housing. So only 13% of these Zoom comments expressed support for the construction of new housing, 61% opposed um, the construction of new housing. Um, and so as, as we thought about potential explanations for these results, right, this was a pretty dramatic change in the structure of these meetings, and yet the dynamics appeared remarkably similar. Um, so one explanation is that the same factors that make it easier for supporters of new housing to participate 
also work for housing opponents. So maybe there were more supporters showing up, but there were also more opponents showing up. Um, and then getting back to this question of interest, again, I want to emphasize this, reducing participation costs, so making it easier to participate, doesn't necessarily increase interest in participating, especially among those who may weakly prefer new housing, right? Um, so we think that opponents are much more passionate about housing than supporters. And it sort of makes sense because a new housing development comes with concentrated costs, but diffuse benefits. If I live next door to a proposed housing development, there's a lot of potential costs to me. Um, I'm gonna have to deal with construction noise for nine months. Um, my parking may de be disrupted during that time period. Um, my views may change. Um, it may sort of signal an abrupt change overall in my community. There are lots of things about that housing being nearby that might motivate me as an opponent. In contrast, I am personally a passionate supporter of new housing, but even I, as someone who cares deeply about this, am not going to every public hearing in my communities to support the construction of three new units of housing. The benefits of each of those small projects is pretty marginal. And so it's pretty hard to imagine a world where you're going to motivate housing supporters to show up to every one of those hearings. Um, and so we think those dynamics make it really hard to get supporters to be interested in participating in hearings about every single proposed housing development. And so taking that more broadly, simply making it easier to participate does not eliminate participatory disparities. So, um, so we, we're still in on a quest then to try to find community engagement strategies that might actually change the dynamics of these processes. And so over this past year, um, I encountered a really exciting project that's happening in a pretty affluent suburb of Boston called Newton, Massachusetts. So they have been involved in what could be charitably described as an extraordinarily contentious rezoning effort to try to increase the density of housing in Newton. Um, it's a very affluent suburb with a lot of mass transit stops. It's very close to Boston. There would be a lot of advantages to building more affordable housing there, um, but there's also a very strong anti-development contingent in that community. Um, and it is, I want to stress, it's an unusually well-organized anti-development force. They actually have a super pack that is quite well funded that supports anti-development candidates and has even gone so far as to make robocalls to community residents and local elections. So that, that's pretty unusual in local politics in the U.S. Um, so in that context, um, the community engagement team dramatically revamped the outreach process because what they found was when they held traditional public hearings or even just Zoom public hearings, they were hearing from that very well-organized voice, the same one that organized a super PAC, over and over again and felt like they weren't hearing from the broader community, which they suspected probably preferred more dense housing and more affordable housing and more transit oriented housing. So they revamped their community outreach process in a number of different ways. Um, they had youth outreach at local high schools. They had self-guided walking tours of village centers. Um, and the piece that I wanna focus on and what for which we did some data analysis is they also use surveys, traditional public hearings, and these really innovative processes called equitable focus groups. So these equitable focus groups were facilitated by community members and relevant commission committees. So things like the Human Rights Commission and the Youth Commission. Um, the planning department was only involved as note takers. So they were not directing these in any meaningful capacity. Um, and at each of these equitable focus groups, participants were asked broad guiding questions about what kinds of changes they desired in their community, if any. And so there were set aside focus groups for a whole series of categories. So there was um, a set for young people, one age 15 to 24, one age 25 to 35, for creatives, um, for members of the BIPOC community, um, so Black and Indigenous people and people of color, um, one for elderly people, um, one for people with disabilities, and then one for renters, and they included as part of the focus group for renters, Mandarin translation and site visits conducted for Mandarin speaking public housing residents because the public housing community in Newton was disproportionately Mandarin speaking. And so focus group members volunteered to participate for a very modest honorarium. Um, they opted in on a website. Um, and sessions, again, were moderated by non-city staff. 
Um, one cool example of this was the youth engagement group was actually moderated by an eighth grader um, who apparently from the interviews that we did, did a tremendous job and really got people engaged in talking, perhaps in a way that a city planner talking to a group of young people might not be able to do. And so here, um, what, I'm, what we did is we essentially went through the meeting minutes for all of these focus groups, um, as well as the, um, the meeting minutes for a more traditional public meeting. Um, and we coded the percentage of comments that were in support of higher density housing. Finally, we also compare these results to a January 2021 survey, which Newton fielded, again, asking similar types of questions about housing. And what we found was that the focus groups elicited um, incredibly positive views about higher density housing. So 100% of the comments about housing in the renters focus group and the young people focus group was in support of the construction of new housing. Even in the uh, focus group for elderly people, which is one where you might have anticipated there being lower levels of support for new housing, we still saw that about 40% of participants expressed support for higher density housing. This was in contrast to the traditional public hearing um, where only 14% you know, of people showed up in support of the construction of new housing. Um, I also, we were really intrigued by the fact that the survey also elicited pretty negative feedback about new housing. Um, and the planner suspects it's because surveys, when they are intentionally done um, to recruit a representative sample, can often in local politics be captured by sort of neighborhood associations and neighborhood groups who simply send the link around to each other and elicit sort of similar types of feedback. So overall, our chief results here were that the focus groups elicited very different kinds of feedback about housing. And just to give you a sense of the kinds of comments um, that were in these, right? There was a real sense among the folks who participated in these focus groups that these created spaces for equitable participation. So one participant noted that I've, I've lived here for only a few years and I've struggled to feel confident in a process where when people who are lifelong residents begin to get loud. And again, for people who've attended public hearings, those kinds of comments, you know, I think really hit home. We, I have been to many public hearings where I've heard people invoke their status as a, you know, a lifelong resident of a community or a resident of 35 years in a community. Um, and these focus groups revealed that, that kind of language can really feel intimidating. A renter noted that they had lived in Newton for over 20 years, but had never participated before because they did not feel that their participation was really welcome. Um, and multiple comments, right, flag that these the proceedings um, outside of these focus groups felt to them like they were dominated by a small group with very strong views. Um, as you might imagine, um, in American politics, whenever we have um, equity-oriented equity policies that explicitly mention race in particular, um, it seems like we end up with backlash. And, and this was the story here too. Um, and so um, the backlash took a few forms. Um, it was really interesting. And here was the one that was sort of most public. Um, so the Newtonville Area Council, which is this really powerful um, neighborhood association, sent around an email um, to its members advising um, their white middle-aged homeowners um, to essentially pretend to be creatives in order to be able to attend the creative focus group. Um, and they, they felt really upset and angry that they were excluded. Um, these focus groups were also intriguingly, so Newton actually just had a municipal election this fall, it was very difficult to find any information about these focus groups um, on the city's website. I ultimately had to actually FOIA all of the meeting minutes for the focus groups because it was very clear that Newton public officials did not want to talk about this very politically touchy topic during an election cycle. Um, and so one of the, the takeaways that we had from this is that this kind of approach can potentially be effective um, at bringing in new voices, but it is vulnerable to backlash and may not be politically palatable to a lot of public officials, right? So it creates spaces for voices that are typically unheard, of, unheard from in public meetings. It generates trust in government but it's really politically challenging to implement and potentially vulnerable to, um, to backlash from traditionally overrepresented groups.
Um, so the other example that we encountered uh, that was felt like a really innovative approach to planning, and some of the folks in this Zoom room may already be familiar with, is the Toronto Civic Lottery. Um, so in November 2017, 10,000 randomly selected Toronto households received a letter from the planning division inviting them to become a member of the Toronto Planning Review pa pa Panel. 425 Toronto residents applied and 32 were randomly selected to join. Um, and the invitations and selection were weighted to ensure proportional representation by really important demographic traits like age, gender, household tenure, home ownership status, race, and geography. Um, this panel received extensive training in local government before meeting once every month on Saturdays. Um, panelists travel costs were covered and food was provided. Um, and so in interviews, what we learned um, was that this panel was able to really provide constructive feedback that supported the development of more housing and progressive transportation goals. And so the general experience was that um, panel participants really felt like they were hearing um, from voices that they hadn't traditionally heard from um, and ones that were considerably more supportive of new housing. Um, and just by way of one example, um, the Toronto Planning Review Panel, they created sort of a set of goals um, and one of their goals was appropriate density, potentially through mandated minimum density and designated intensification areas. Um, and again, folks who are familiar with this space would probably know that getting um, people to agree at a public meeting to mandated minimum density um, is not something that would be really sort of typical of those proceedings, right? And again, suggests that hearing from these underrepresented voices may lead to more support for housing. But um, again, as in the Newton example, there was some backlash um, from white people in Toronto, um, which included some harassment and threats to a, a Muslim review board planning uh, member, um, as well as planning staff. So they all experienced some of that backlash, um, perhaps even more challenging from the perspective of sort of keeping this as a long-term institution was that there really wasn't staff capacity to keep this going. Um, and that in many ways it fell by the wayside when a key staff member who was responsible for organizing it moved on to another position. Um, and this is again, I think a real challenge in local politics when we have these kinds of innovative programming um, is that they are really um, labor intensive and resource intensive to do. And when you have someone who's really passionate about it, you can keep it going, um, but when those staff inevitably move on to other opportunities, it can be hard to keep those kinds of institutions um, functioning. And so again, the lessons that, that we took away from this civic lottery is that many underrepresented voices are eager to participate more, even with a substantial time commitment, right? Like joining this panel um, was a major time commitment, um, but they were still able to get folks from these underrepresented groups who are interested and excited to be a part of these proceedings. Um, but racial backlash is a significant threat to equitable engagement programs, and that limited staff capacity may prevent many local governments from pursuing equity-oriented community engagement. So just in conclusion, taking these, these different strands of research together, um, what we find is that community engagement processes um, around housing in particular, but also more broadly, are seriously flawed and exacerbate existing political inequalities in most communities. It makes it harder to build affordable and market rate housing, especially in high opportunity communities. So some of the recommendations that we have um, from this research are to be really mindful of when we ask for community engagement. It's not reasonable to ask people for hours of their time for every new housing proposal. And so we need to set our planning and land use so that um, each time someone wants to build an apartment building, it doesn't require us to try to mobilize a group of supporters to show up to these hearings. We also suggest that just making it easier to participate will not reduce disparities. These strategies must be paired with programs that build trust and actively recruit participants from marginalized communities. Um, good community engagement practices are staff and resource intensive, and so that communities who are serious about this need to be prepared to invest both. Um, and any equity-oriented community engagement push will be vulnerable to backlash, especially if it's sort of explicit about race and racial equity. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to present this work, and I really look forward to your comments and questions. Thank you very much. That was great. Uh, 
Um, so uh, we have lots of folks on the call and we also have lots of time. So uh, um, so I'm hoping that uh, there's, certainly I have questions. <laughs> so, but I'm gonna hold mine. Uh, and I'm, I'm hoping that there's lots of other questions. And uh, the way we're gonna do this is that, uh, um, please just raise your little Zoom raise hand, use the raise hand function. And uh, that'll keep people in the order that they've raised their hands for me. Um, and uh, I will, I will call on people in order and we'll take it from there. Um, unless Katie, do you, would you like me to moderate actually, or would you like to do it yourself? Whatever you prefer, I'm happy to do it either way. Okay. Um, well, why don't you go ahead then? Because you see people are raising their hands. Yeah, I can well. absolutely. So you may as right. well, right? You cut out the middle. Yeah, I'm happy to. Okay. All right, John. So first, thank you very much for the speaking. It's uh, incredible research to hear about. Um, so. You mentioned early on that we have overrepresentation from people who are over 50 and also from homeowners. I'm curious if you took a look at how much those overlap. Like if we take a look at people who are over 50, are homeowners disproportionately present in that group and vice versa? Absolutely, yeah. So we, um, I presented sort of the simple cross tabulations here, but we also mm -hmm. did regression models where we look at this. And so, yeah, even if you like control for age, homeowners are more likely to participate. And even if you control for home ownership, right, older people are more likely to participate. So both um, are significant um, and predictive of participation in these hearings. I'm not surprised, but it's great to hear confirmed. Uh, the other one, uh, other hopefully quick question I have for you is you mentioned expertise is very dissuasive to uh, the other side of the issue. I'm curious, uh, is, dis or is the expertise dissuasive only to the opposing viewpoint? Or is it something where when you have someone who levers their expertise, does it also reduce participation from people who share their perspective as though they're resting on the laurels of said expert? Yeah, so one of the, um, we, we rely on sort of other scholars research on this, which has found that um, when folks sort of start wielding expertise, it can feel intimidating to other people in that space. And that can be true regardless of your viewpoint. Um, so we're sort of agnostic as to whether that would be more dissuasive um, to opponents or supporters. Um, in our analysis of these meeting minutes, what we find typically is that opponents of new housing are more likely to sort of invoke their status as a lawyer, as an architect, as a realtor, and so on, um, in opposing the construction of new housing. Um, and that that kind of um, that kind of language can be really intimidating. It's hard to sort of push back to, if someone says they're a lawyer and this doesn't look legal and you have no sort of personal expertise with zoning law, right? You might be disinclined to sort of push back against that. Thank okay, you. so you don't you don't see as much support from say, hey, I'm an environmental activist and the environment seems good, so support <laughs> this. That that doesn't happen. We haven't seen it as much. I I caution that that may be happening more now that some pro housing groups are getting more organized right so a lot of our data analysis is precedes you know the emergence of yimby movements and other kinds of pro housing movements and so it may be that that language happens more now we didn't see it as much in our analysis with the full acknowledgement of the limitations of the time period we studied thank you okay thank you again yeah of course um jesse <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, fascinating uh, research. I'm downloading the papers uh, as you're talking, so um, I look forward to digging into those. Um, I had a question just looking at differential participation. Um, did you follow one step beyond that to see what were the outcomes? So people show up, they oppose the housing. Is the housing approved regardless or is it or is it denied? Yeah, no. So we um, qualitatively trace this for a number of and find that pretty consistently what ends up happening. So in a few cases, um, the housing is just outright denied, right? That it just, it's prevented and never gets built. Um, but the most common outcome is this shrinking of proposals. And you know, the, like the one I opened the talk with where, um, you know, a developer comes in saying, I want to build four units and they end up only getting to build three units. Um, and so it's that kind of more modest back and forth that seems to be the most common outcome where everyone sort of seeks this compromise solution. Um, and in terms of uh, the differential participation, did you look at to what extent the rules around you know, who should be notified that there are changes being proposed, uh, how the electoral boundaries are organized, things like that, um, how some of those rules might impact the participation specifically of renters who often don't get notified of these things? <laughs> 
Yeah, so we thought a lot about this, the notification rules, um, and it's definitely sort of on our to-do list. And if anyone else wants to engage in this kind of study, I would love to read your work too. Um, but one of the things that happens with a lot of notification rules is the notifications about developments are only required to go to homeowners. Um, and so they never go to the renters in those communities. And so renters may not even be aware um, of proposed developments in their community. So that that is, you know, potentially would reduce your sense of efficacy in participating. Um, my caution on that, there's actually research um, from a political scientist named Mike Hankinson, who studies um, support for new housing among both renters and homeowners in high cost cities. And he finds that renters in high cost cities actually oppose the construction of new housing close to them. And so um, if you were to ask me to pick like what, if I could only do one reform um, to housing, I don't think the notification system would be at the top of my list, but I do think um, it potentially is again, a, among a whole series of political institutions that reifies the political power of homeowners as opposed to renters and signals to homeowners that their voices matter more than renters. Yeah, we should talk further. My dissertation is on these things. So. Oh, cool. No, I would love to read your work um, and you know, any analysis that you know of in that space. Thank you. Um, Joe. Yeah, I was going to ask a kind of rule question too, um, but just kind of in contradiction to well, I'm just imagining how a process might play out, like kind of the one, I guess taking the, the process in Toronto to a little further along and that, so maybe you have this participatory process, but then there are rules that with each application, there must be a public meeting, right? And then those are open and then they're going to be dominated by the same homeowners. So, you know, whether that people are involved in this participatory process that engenders trust, but then and that might help inform some broad policy documents, but then when actual decisions get made on particular files, if those policies aren't followed, then that could lead to mistrust. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and to me, um, and you know, one of the recommendations that we have is that um, public input is both appropriate and important when making sort of city level planning decisions. Um, but we think that land use and zoning should be incredibly clear and transparent. Um, and that once the zoning is set, developers should be able to build up to the limit of zoning without having to go through these um, ad hoc processes for every single development, which just, it introduces an incredible amount of uncertainty into the housing development process. And so again, it's not to say that we shouldn't have community engagement, but that we should really be targeted about it to avoid this exact problem that you mentioned, that if, if we just have community engagement, at, um, a representative process at one stage, but still have meetings for every single housing development, then we will run into the same ad hoc problems. So thank you. Um, John. Yeah, thank you, Catherine. Um, first of all, uh, great piece of research um, uh, from the presentation. Really enjoy the perspective. And this is something that you don't hear a lot about. Um, and two things that come to mind. One is I'm not too surprised about the roughly 13%, as you were saying, that are coming to public events um, relating to planning applications because they don't like, or sorry, because they're there to support it. That I think that goes to our relationships too. Um, you know, how, how we interact with each other is we're much more likely to speak up when we don't like something than we are when we are sort of satisfied with what's happening. And it would be interesting to relate that to other kinds of government engagements. So how does the housing planning kind of side of things relate to engagement in other processes, budget or otherwise? You know, I was seeing sort of similar types of engagement and who's there to say what, um, or is it different for these kinds of processes? Uh, the other uh, perspective I just wanted to raise is um, as a planner that was involved in um, preparing a, a long-term official plan, uh, very much so, lots and lots of support for um, intensification and, and housing, but see the same thing that uh, when you get to individual applications, um, things change a lot in terms of people's perspectives. Um, but that said, I think municipalities in general don't do a very good job in sort of seeding the ground. And so very good at regulation policy, even some programming incentives but not a lot of the work on the education side of things. And it was, there was an opportunity through this plan process to do some of that. And we could see people kind of thinking, oh, it's a trade-off between intensification 
in climate, in environment, in healthier communities, and all that kind of stuff, and, and affordable housing. But um, then we lose traction in terms of that conversation as soon as the big official plan process is over, and now you're into site by site implementation. So I think that cities, as you've pointed out, some good examples can do a lot better job in terms of getting out there with real purpose to try and explain, educate, bring people along creatively in, in why this is important, how you can actually introduce um, intensification, new projects uh, in, into existing neighborhoods really effectively and what it does. And the last thing I'll say is urban design, I think is really important because imagine that's what's coming to their neighborhood and that's when they stand up and say, I don't want this. So the better it is, and it doesn't have to be gold-plated, but something that fits into the context of neighborhood and we can point to good examples. The more of those, uh, the better. And I think design's a big piece of that. Thanks again for your work. Oh, thank you. No, these are such great comments. Um, and so just to pick up threads on a, a few of these, um, there's a lot of good psychological research that suggests that like negativity and opposition is more motivating than support. And I think people who've done this to like look at food reviews and things like this, right? So at restaurant reviews and things like that. So um, I think that that point is really well taken about sort of what psychologically motivates us. Um, and I, I think it is absolutely the case that these city level processes are much more likely to garner support than specific proposals. Um, and you know, you mentioned cities do a bad job of educating people. I just want to add to that developers also do a really bad job of educating people about what they're doing. Um, so one of our follow up projects that I, I didn't present on today, we actually sort of analyze um, how developers present themselves at these hearings compared with members of the public. And while members of the public really invoke themselves quite effectively as defenders of the neighborhood and community representatives, developers just they don't even bother to try to show how their plans fit in with broader community aims. They talk about like, well, this will make us money. So that's what we're doing. And um, obviously, developer profit seeking is not a remotely sympathetic aim or something that really fits in with broader community interests. Some of the more effective developer presentations are ones that do mention this community needs more affordable housing. And here we've devoted 20% of our units to affordable housing. So I do think there are ways that both communities and private developers could better present what they're doing um, and engage in more high quality communication. So thank you, um, Jack. Sorry if I could just say, and budget is key, right? Because it's great to talk about these things, but um, if cities don't actually put money into the resources required to do it in a meaningful way and get that word out there and, and develop the understanding and it just doesn't happen or it doesn't happen effectively thank you absolutely. for those comments yeah absolutely um jack thanks katie that's a really great talk and amazing research so um thanks for being here and presenting it uh, you know one of the things that you talk about in the book and is one of the extreme kind of challenges of this is the I think of as like the hyper hyper local representational claims that people make that makes things like civic lotteries so difficult because people say it's so common for people to say I support intensification densification in fact I support it in my own neighborhood it's just on this specific corner it doesn't make sense on that specific parcel like it doesn't make any sense because of this that or the other thing. So some randomly selected group of people, even if they're perfectly representative of the community. Um, people will say, well, that they're not, they don't understand the specific details of this specific corner, et cetera. So, so my question is sort of the, if that is a, a, in some ways, a kind of insurmountable challenge, I have a, like a hard hearted, a hard headed policy question to ask you, which is like, what are the available tools to sort of buy off the local community and convince them of the value of intensification that are out there that, that maybe work better in terms of promising amenities or promising like what can be done to just persuade people to feel like well you know I don't love the idea that I'm gonna have more people parking on my street or whatever the complaint might be but we're also going to get this other thing like what's in the toolbox on the incentive side of things yeah, so there's a whole bunch of different examples of like these community bargaining agreements. Um, and I think it, it absolutely makes sense that fundamentally, you are never going to convince um, people that, you know, that one parcel should be built up. 
unless you can say, well, and you'll also get a lot more money for that park across the street that you've always wanted money for, right? Um, you know, another version of this um, is there's been increasing opposition in some high cost cities to new development on the grounds that it will further gentrification. Um, and so you end up with these sort of perhaps surprising situations where there even are some communities that will reject amenities that'll say, we don't want a bike lane, we don't want like nicer parks because it will attract more rich people who will crowd us out. And so in those contexts, um, accompanying um, those kinds of policies with promises of rent stabilization, for example, or promises of building more affordable housing or eviction protections, right? We can think of different kinds of policy bargains to draw. Um, I've also seen some of those kinds of bargains happen at the um, state legislative level, where a lot of actually the more promising action around land use is happening, where in exchange for allowing market rate, um, you know, making it easier to build market rate housing, um, the the uh, sort of proponents will also say, okay, we'll put in eviction protections and rent stabilization measures as well to bring in other coalition partners. But I, I absolutely think any kind of long-term successful um, housing strategies is going to involve that kind of bargaining and give and take, both at the hyper-local level and also at the state level. Um, Martin. Okay. Um, so uh, you've already alluded to this a little bit, I think, um, but... Um, I want to push the idea of the effects of the participation system in the sense that, uh, you know, in both Canada and the United States, um, homeowners and others, local residents have so many different opportunities to intervene in these processes. There's local elections, there's the annual budget process, there's the master planning process, there's these little zoning decisions you're talking about in Ontario, there's even appeals process to the Ontario Land Tribunal after decisions have been made, right? So there's all of these opportunities to participate. Um, and of course, that's built on this long history of stemming from the 60s and 70s where local government was much more opened up, right? And, and it was that was built at the time and it was widely viewed as a very progressive movement. And I'm wondering whether ironically, there might be a case to be made for the regressive results of that opening up uh, in a context where you know, the people who are participating are so socially and economically unequal. Um, and uh, if that's the case, then, and it's kind of ties into what you were saying earlier, is there also, and I'm being a little provocative deliberately here, I suppose, but is there also a case to be made for less participation opportunities um, and perhaps the equity benefits of those? Uh, because we've tended to focus on, you know, as you said, you know, providing more opportunities, making things more accessible, including more people, Maybe that's kind of the wrong way to be going. Maybe that's maybe that's really an uphill battle. Yeah, no, I, I think there there is actually a strong case to be made that the pendulum has swung too far in favor of having um, having community participation and all of these local government decisions under the guise of transparency, right, and community engagement. But in practice, it's sort of weaponizing homeowners to be able to control everything that happens in their communities. Um, and when we look at like local election day, which the like, local elections are by no means a representative set of the population, we know those are low turnout affairs and not terribly representative. They're a lot more representative than what we see at these community meetings. Um, and so in some ways, if, if you're looking to sort of what are, what are more successful manifestations of local democracy and how do we get a more representative um, vote, in some ways, it seems to me like challenge, you know, ch um, targeting local elections um, and trying to get representatives that make decisions that are genuinely beneficial to members of the community um, seems better. That said, the reason we ended up with these community engagement processes is we had, um, to, to a large extent, um, a really developer dominated system um, in the 1960s. And so this was like a real reaction to the fact that developers were, you know, bulldozing um, working class communities and communities of color in, in the United States and elsewhere. And so I think um, I, I don't want to push for a corrupt system in which people um, in communities have no voice at all. Um, that, that's clearly not a pendulum we want to swing back towards. But um, I, I do think um, when we talk about community engagement as a form of increasing representation, I think we're missing what a lot of the empirical evidence is really showing us. Um, and we should look a lot more critically about how often we turn to you know, so-called community engagement and whether it's really engagement. Um, yeah, Zach. Well, I think Martin basically asked the first two thirds of my question. I think we're kind of a one mind on that. I was, you know, one of the 
things that happened in, in certainly in Ontario, as in elsewhere in North America, is we had this participatory revolution in the 1960s and 70s, which led to the institutionalization of participation on a scale that, that never occurred before. And uh, the tweak that I want to uh, ask you about is um, kind of the scale at which this occurs. I mean, what, what Ontario probably has the most prescriptive planning legislation on the continent. Um, uh, all of these procedural tripwires and participatory opportunities are, are baked into our, our, our land use legislation that, that municipalities must uh, conform to. So it's probably a, a way more centralized environment than you're, you're, you're certainly used to. Um, so I'm wondering how this intersects with issues of, of, of devolution and scale and municipality size, right? Uh, do you think that the size of the local government unit uh, and the location of the rule maker around participation matters in terms of creating more local buy-in to the process? Yeah. No, I mean, I, we've thought a lot about this as sort of in what demographic context is this problem worse or better? Um, and so to, to what I've said, I would say it's like really terrible everywhere. Like the, the data that we study um, includes some very big cities, some very racially diverse places, um, some less affluent places, and then some like very small, very affluent and homogenous communities. And these disparities persist everywhere. Um, that said, um, I do think there, there are some important variations. I tend to think that this problem would be easier to address in some capacities in big cities where there's already more local organizing um, around mobilizing sort of underrepresented groups. And I think there's on the part of some political candidates to mobilize those groups. Um, we also actually found um, in Massachusetts that some of the worst political inequalities that we saw, they're not in like Boston or Cambridge. They're actually in, so Massachusetts has this designation called gateway cities, but they're basically sort of older deindustrialized mill towns um, that are now home to pretty large Hispanic populations um, that are you know, very, very underrepresented in a variety of political proceedings. And there's a lot of research that shows that those communities, we find that they're incredibly politically unequal. There's actually other research that shows that racial disparities in incarceration in those communities is way higher than it is in bigger cities like Boston, where there's a more robust sort of political activism and more robust social service agencies and just civic culture for those areas. So if, if I were to flag a place where like this problem is probably the worst, it's in some of those more economically marginalized communities um, with diverse populations where there may not be sort of civic culture or party organizations or nonprofits um, that mobilize or support those communities. Um, but no, that's it's a great question sort of about city size and city context. And it's definitely something we're thinking a lot about in our ongoing research. Um, AJ. I am here, sorry, one second. <laughs> Uh, excellent talk. Um, this is really fascinating research, and um, it actually reminds me a lot of the wire. Uh, I'm going to mispronounce the name of that university, a business school, so bad. Uh, Wharton, uh, <laughs> the Residential Land Use Utility Index. Um, I think it was back in 2010 they did the study similar. They reviewed development applications, but it was very much more of a spatial econometrics type analysis. Um, but I actually want to build off of uh, Dr. Taylor and Dr. Horak's question. Um, so recently, there was changes made by the province to the Planning Act that provided for delegated approval for what we would call a minor zone change or a minor variance um, and bypasses quite a few provisions now in the Planning Act um, in those procedural tripwires that Dr. Taylor was mentioning. Uh, and maybe a little bit of a tin technocracy um, sort of reasserting itself again in planning. Um, so I'd be fascinated to hear sort of your opinion from a Massachusetts case. Oh my gosh, my English today is terrible. Um, and um, whether you think, you know, uh, there is sort of a balance we need to strike, like maybe the, the pendulum has swung too far over into the public participation side of things, especially when you know, you're dealing with low information voters that may not, um, may only have sort of a worldview that is caring about their, you know, four corner piece of green grass uh, on a street and can't really think of outside of that um, broader box. 
Yeah, no, this is, it, this is such a great question. It's like, what is the exact right level of public participation? And, you know, our research can tell us we're not there right now, that we, we've gone too far. But the question is right. Um, and I think I've had a few questions in this. This is another great example. It's like, how far do we swing back? Um, so after writing this book, I foolishly felt so inspired to like help in my um, surrounding community that I actually joined my local redevelopment board, like my local planning board, and so sat um, for um, about a year hearing proposals. Um, and one of the things you have know, thinking about these procedural tripwires, um, if you were a business and wanted to put up a sign, you had to go before the planning board and sometimes had to go through there like multiple times to get approval for your sign before you could open up your business, right? And you can imagine how those delays would get very expensive if you're a small business. Um, and there were similar kinds of procedural approvals, obviously, um, if you want to build an apartment building or build like two units of housing. Um, and so I favor right now policies that I think remove a lot of those procedural tripwires and, and make it easier to build housing with the caveat that we obviously need to hold our, our locally elected officials accountable if we're getting development decisions and building decisions that don't meet the needs of the community. Um, but, but I think we need to move more to a place where we're holding public officials accountable for the decisions that they make um, at regularly scheduled elections, as opposed to having um, public hearings at, over you know, the course of multiple months, every single time someone wants to put in a new restaurant or every time someone wants to put in a small um, housing development. So no, thank you. Um, Thomas. Hello. Um... I was wondering, uh, to what extent do you believe that someone's ideology would kind of come into play based on whether or not they, they support these kinds of things in neighborhoods? No, this is such a great question. So we do find um, that people who are more conservative um, and more members of the Republican Party are more likely to oppose the construction of new housing. Um, but this study, um, most of our empirical evidence comes from very liberal places. Um, Cambridge, Massachusetts is sort of famously one of the most liberal places um, in the United States and also features um, really strong opposition to the construction of new housing. So this is absolutely something that plagues um, more left-leaning communities. Um, you know, anyone who studies housing development in California, right, same kind of deal. So, um, so while it is empirically true that more conservative people are more likely to oppose new housing, it is also the case that strong majorities of liberals in most of these places are along for the ride in opposing the housing as well. Um, Gus. Thank you, Catherine, for this wonderful uh, talk. Um, I, I just have a question. It's, it's uh, strongly related to, to my, my personal interests, uh, but I, I wonder if you could illuminate some of these uh, issues for me. I'm interested in um, uh, the role that the issues around education and, and schooling, the provision of schooling, you know, access to schooling, availability to schooling, uh, uh, all concerns around schooling, you know, segregation, all these different issues that uh, 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 different constituencies may be concerned about, whether so, some of those issues uh, play a role in some of the processes that you have uh, uh, identified and, and studied, right? Um, uh, and and, uh, and a, a related uh, question is whether you see also local educational authorities um, interested or involved in these processes and, and, and to what extent they do, because uh, there's a bit of a difference uh, uh, in, in, in the Canadian context where, where uh, uh, th that involvement is not uh, as clear um, and, and is much more mediated uh, compared to what we may see in other jurisdictions. Yeah, no, this is a really great question. Um, so in the US, right, our schools are um, administered very locally. Um, so they're administered either by separate school districts um, sort of at the, the city or county level, um, or they're actually administered by the city government, depending upon where you are. Um, and we find that um, in many contexts, the schools are sort of used as an excuse to oppose new housing. Um, so, oh, no, no, we can't have any, that, that apartment building of, you know, 10 new units is going to overcrowd our schools. We can't, we can't build any more because the schools will get too crowded. Um, interestingly, despite the fact that those arguments are wielded regularly, I, we didn't come across examples of the school districts themselves coming forward and saying, you know, oh, we can't accept new people. So that these data don't typically come from like school committee members or the schools themselves. It's more community members invoking the schools as a reason to oppose development. So that's sort of one piece. 
Um, the other pieces in the US, there are also a lot of public hearings about schools. Um, and anyone who follows um, American news has probably knows that our, our school meetings have lately become extraordinarily contentious because of the so-called, you know, critical race theory um, as a problem in our schools. So there has been like just some pretty extraordinary conflagrations at American school meetings. Um, so I think there's some really interesting research to be done about the dynamic of those school meetings and like who's showing up and how um, sort of the modern conservative movement has mobilized people to show up at these hearings to oppose the teaching of a pretty esoteric academic theory supposedly at like schools, right? So I, I think that that's separately super interesting, but I appreciate you raising the example of schools because I think it's a place where better understanding the dynamics of community meetings would help us really understand public policy in that space. Um, and Valerian. I think you're muted. Yes, I am muted. Uh, hi. A large proportion of Canadian population came through immigration, and this proportion will increase in the next years. Um, you mentioned the Spanish speaking um, uh, residents in the US. Do you have any suggestion how to improve immigrant populations' participation in the process? Yeah, so I, this has actually been another sort of ongoing project that we've been working on. Um, and we conducted interviews um, with a lot of um, groups that are sort of doing this kind of um, community engagement work in Massachusetts. And so um, a few of the recommendations they had, one, this was super interesting. They said, don't use Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or whatever for social media, use WhatsApp, because that is what a lot of folks um, in um, the Spanish speaking community in those places use. And they found it to be incredibly effective for outreach um, around COVID-19 vaccines. That was sort of the context we were talking about community outreach. So that was a sort of interesting thinking about, you know, our reliance on particular, you know, tools, um, you know, regarding like social media might actually be missing um, important populations that we should be really conscientious about what tools we're using. Um, they also emphasize the importance of going to meet people where they are and um, partnering with trusted community intermediaries. Um, so I spoke with a um, state legislator from a community, he's, um, he's Latino, who helped um, to organize sort of a planning uh, meeting by um, by encouraging, by bringing together people um, after church, like basically having a bunch of free food after church um, at a predominantly Spanish speaking church, and then having um, sort of someone from planning, the planning department come and talk about potential rezoning at that, at that meeting, right? And so I think not requiring people to you know, drag themselves over to city hall um, and making proceedings as convenient as possible and meeting them where they are um, is really important. Um, and so, um, so that, that feels like a, a key recommendation. Well, we have a few more minutes if we need them. So if anybody has another question, um, feel free to pop in. Joe? Well, sorry, I'm off, forget what my hair looks like when I'm off screen. Um, so you mentioned the staff capacity issue and as someone who teaches a lot of administrators, that's something that's kind of interesting to me because you know, from my interactions with them, I know they are exa an exhausted bunch, like they're continually being asked to do more. So I'm just wondering if you came across any good examples of ways in which staff were kind of compensated uh, to do this kind of work? It's a really hard job. And I, I was, when I, in my time in the planning board, I was really blown away at how hard our planners worked and how many evening meetings they had to go through and just how much abuse they had to take from people. Um, Right. And so I, I think to some extent, figuring out ways, um, you know, fewer public hearings or more efficiently structured public hearings would probably go a long way towards making um, planners lives easier. Uh, but I think fundamentally, and I can't remember who said this, this, it really comes down to resources is having more money available to hire more people dedicated um, to planning and to housing. Um, as part um, of another project I'm working on, I'm studying homelessness and how homelessness is administered at the local level. Um, and a lot of local governments in the United States don't have a single staff person dedicated to homelessness, um, simply because they don't have the resources or maybe they haven't made it a top policy priority. Um, 
And I think not having those staff really limits a coherent response to that important policy challenge. Um, and I would love to see more academic work that was focused on how cities are staffing these incredibly important policy decisions. So I think those bureaucratic choices matter a lot. Okay, well, if there aren't any further questions, um, I hope you'll join me now in uh, thanking uh, Professor Einstein for a wonderful talk. Thank you very much. That was fantastic. Um, obviously, uh, there was a wide ranging discussion as well. I think the, the, the issues that you're looking at, they really, they connect to some pretty fundamental questions in politics about representation and participation and inequality and how those how those elements interact. Right? So, uh, so it may be a local lens, but they're big questions. Uh, so, uh, so we really appreciate you spending time with us. Um, now, if you're, if any of you are interested in finding out more about Professor Einstein's work, um, you can certainly look at her webpage at Boston University. She's got information there. And if there's anything else that you'd like to share with us, Professor Einstein, in terms of connections where people can look for information, that would be great. Um, and I'll just say as well that. Uh, um, we will be having some more events. We're planning some more events at the Center for Urban Policy and Local Governance, hopefully some in person as well in the near future. So for those of you who are interested in that, keep an eye on our webpage and you can also get on our mailing list. Um, so uh, once again, thank you to everybody for joining and uh, uh, thank you for everybody to help me make this happen. And uh, I hope you all have a great afternoon. Thank you so much, everyone.